The Battle of Tentativa, fought between the navies of the Concordat and Federated Sons, was the largest space battle in history, featuring over 250 craft, plus almost 50 others in the adjacent systems. More than half of the AFFS's warships had fought at Tentativa, and a third of the Torian strength. By battle's end, the Davian navy had been reduced to only a quarter of its former size. But a mere three years later, Tentativa would be considered nothing but an appetizer for what was to follow at Robsart, where three times those figures would be engaged. Operation Bullrun, the Star League's invasion of the Torian Concordat, began on May 15, 2578, 15 days after the declaration of war. It was a campaign that had been a long time coming, the earliest engagement between the two going back more than half a decade to the Malagrotta affair. The invasion had been scheduled to commence the previous year, but Tentativa had resulted in many months of delays while additional forces were moved to the front, which in turn gave the Torians more time to fortify. The TDF's 3rd Corps added the newly formed 82nd Concordat Chasseurs to the Battle Meg roster, bringing the total number of fielded by the Praetorian Defence Force at the war's outset to just under 38 regiments. Since its inception, Task Force Taurus had grown to include a 5th Corps, meaning Wexworth's army now accounted for 40% of the entire SLDF. The first wave of Operation Bullrun was to target a dozen worlds all along the border. The plan called for a wide front to keep the Torians engaged all along the line and prevent them from striking out into the Federated Suns. Most of the corps were tasked with a pair of worlds, and Wexworth anticipated they would be beginning the second wave by year's end. The first engagement of the invasion took place in the Ridgebrook system, where the SLN's 3rd Fleet encountered a Concordat warship squadron. Four of the Torian vessels were destroyed, at the cost of three from the Star League, but also ten dropships which accounted for a regiment of casualties before even making landfall. That came on the 22nd, when the 1st Royal Division touched down a week after entering the system. The fighting on Ridgebrook didn't get going until 2nd Division joined them a few days later on the 25th of May. Surrounding the planetary capital and the 2nd's landing site was the Golden Ridge mountain range, which had been heavily fortified by Torian militia. Using large artillery emplacements, they were able to destroy almost another regiment and several more dropships. Defending the planet were the 2nd and 15th Fortress Battalions, but those were the only TDF regulars. Though they wouldn't last long, it was the planetary militia that resisted the SLDF invasion for four months, an occurrence that would become all too common as the SLDF advanced. It would take until September 12th for this first planet to fall. One of the units that fought on Ridgebrook was the 43rd Royal Light Horse. As replacements began filtering out to the periphery, a young lieutenant recently graduated from the Royal Santas Military Academy was among them. No one in the regiment knew, but his lance mates were actually a personal bodyguard, as the new recruit was none other than the First Lord's son, Nicholas Cameron. Things went even more poorly on Cuterville. Here the 9th Division faced off against a far larger force, a volunteer guard unit consisting of a pair of mech battalions and three armour regiments. The Taurian colonel was an expert at waging guerrilla campaigns, and the invasion bogged down into six months of protracted fighting. After half a year, Major General Wright of Third Corps had run out of patience and replaced Yulan with Lieutenant General Priest Hamand, someone who was considered a specialist in countering guerrilla actions. Even still, it took a further five months to achieve even a partial victory, by which point Operation Bull Run was a year old. Sixth Corps had the lion's share of responsibility during the first wave, and would ultimately take credit for four worlds taken. They began their moves in July when the 16th, 17th Royal and 18th Divisions landed on Malagrotta, Somad and Armington, respectively. Malagrotta, as the site of a significant pre-war naval engagement, was expected to be heavily garrisoned, and so 4th Corps' Amar Legat agreed to lend additional naval support. The two SLN squadrons entered the system on high alert, but encountered no resistance. 16th Division took up positions on the various planets, moons and asteroids soon after, and confirmed that the Taurians had abandoned their operations at Malagrotta sometime the previous year. Taurian resistance on Samad was organised by Colonel Maria Rubin, who was hoping to prove as equally troublesome as our counterpart on Cuderville. The 17th Royal had different intentions, though. This was one of the few instances of a planetary conquest happening on schedule, as Rubin was killed within the first week of fighting, and the guerrillas largely gave up after two months of resisting. The 18th had similar success on Armington, but two regiments of TDF armour and three of motorised infantry, and it would take until the end of the year for the majority of the world to be pacified. Approximately one year after Admiral Sarah Vincent first entered the Tentativa system, the AFFS Auxiliary Corps was making another move against that world, this time with ground forces in tow. The depleted Davian fleet could only spare a single squadron of warships, which the SLN matched. The two task forces again encountered the Concord Navy, but this time there was no epic battle. The smaller Torian squadron made repeated long-distance jabs at the Star League fleet as they moved towards the planet before leaving the system shortly after the AFFS made landfall. 
A brief campaign against a handful of armour and infantry battalions saw the world conquered soon after. The campaign so far had been successful but slow moving. The SLDF had only made landfall on six planets by the time they had anticipated the entire first wave concluding, and of those six, many were still being contested. To free up some of the frontline troops, reserve corps brigades began arriving in late 2578, which would allow the invaders to move on. With Ridgebrook more or less taken in September, 1st and 3rd Brigades moved on to Rentham, where the young Nicholas Cameron made his combat debut. In the first six months he was promoted to Lance Commander, and within the year promoted up to Company Commander. The campaign on Rentham was brief, but the casualties were high on both sides. By October, 4th Corps' naval assets had made it back to them from Malagrotta, and they made their first move to the war with the invasion of Anaheim. 12th Division entered the system with the 4th Fleet's Attack Squadron 2 acting as escort. They made landfall on October 14th and initially seemed to be making solid progress. Nine days later, the lack of Concord Navy presence caused the 4th Fleet to recall its assets, but this came at the worst possible moment as shortly afterwards, Torium warships entered the system and destroyed 4th Corps' transport flotilla. With 12th Division cut off, they had to dedicate a significant amount of time to re-establishing lines of communication, slowing the ground campaign. The rest of 4th Corps moved to Anaheim in support in early 2579. 16th Division finally found the naval battle they had been looking for in Malagrotta when they moved to S1 in November. The SLN detachment was too strong for the Torian defenders, who lost a corvette and a pair of dropships in their attempt to prevent the regular army from making landfall. Last of the Torian worlds to see action in 2578 was Trousen, the AWFS Auxiliary Corps' second target. Major General Troy had a clear numbers advantage, going up against two armour regiments with six mech regiments of his own. But it was after the main battle was concluded that the AWFS got its first taste of Torian guerrilla fighting, and yet again a planetary conquest dragged on for months. Meanwhile, on the Canopian front, the brief pause was coming to an end, and in July 2578, Manic began her second wave. The first trio of worlds she targeted were former Free Worlds planets that had broken away during the Third Andorian War. Albert the Great had been too preoccupied dealing with the Capellans to divert any of his attention, but now Marion sought to resolve the issue. The worlds in question were fearful of retribution for their prior actions, but unbeknownst to them, Marion hoped to win their allegiance diplomatically rather than by military subjugation. To help in this endeavour, she made full use of her FWLM Auxiliary Corps, with every regiment assigned to either Payvand, Rusheg, or Schuerheg, the hope being that it would look less like the conquest of an outsider and more like the return of their old allies. Marion did not send them alone, however, as beginning with the second wave, she made it her policy to concentrate at least two brigades per planet, and 7th Corps made its presence known. By December, the last of the resistance had been put down, and the leaders of the three worlds were invited aboard Marion's flagship, the FWLS Albert Marrick. Here, she surprised all of them by offering them a choice to remain independent of the Free Worlds League as part of the magistracy, or they could rejoin willingly. In reality, they would be consigning themselves to years of post-war military governorship had they gone with the former, but nevertheless, it set an important precedent for later political upheaval within the Marek League, and in early 2579, the Free Worlds made the first territorial gain at the Reunification War, when all three agreed to rejoin. In 2579, Ian Cameron used his authority as First Lord to pass without debate Addendum 2 of the Ares Conventions, formally rescinding them in their entirety. In reality, the conventions were borderline defunct already, but Marion Marrick continued to stress that she expected both the SLDF and FWLM under her command to act in accordance with those documents. The Outworlds Alliance during this period was not idle, and was continuing to expand its arsenal, with the bulk of its equipment coming from the Draconis Combine and the Federated Suns, two nations they were theoretically at war with. These clandestine arms deals soon came to the attention of Alexander Davian, but the First Prince saw an opportunity where his fellow council lords might have seen a threat. He dispatched his younger son Lawrence to treat with the delegation from the Outworlds on the Alliance world of Tancredi, a world that in Alexander's youth had been the capital of the Draconis March of the Federated Sons, and the site of his Aunt Laura's final defeat during the Davian Civil War. The two nations started discussions in March, and immediately this began to bear fruit for the periphery realm. More weapons than ever were now making their way to the Outworlds, who would continue to stockpile arms in preparation for the inevitable. Task Force Taurus's first wave finally concluded in March of 2579, with the end of the 11th month battle for Cudaville. It marked the first organised unit that the TDF had lost during the war, even if only a volunteer guard regiment, but it would set a precedent of Taurians fighting to the last man, 
This loss was offset by the creation of the 88th Concorde Chasseurs Mech Regiment within the Pleiades Cluster. Around this time, General Wexworth received orders from the MOC that his lackluster performance had been noted and was urged to show real progress soon. For now, Commanding General Lee had his back as he understood the optimistic targets that had been set pre-war were unrealistic in the face of stiff guerrilla opposition, but the First Lord had sold the Star League public on a short war and the troubles on the Taurian front were proving embarrassing for him. Wexworth began planning a major new offensive for 2580. In preparation for this, he redeployed significant numbers of his troops, too many changes to list here, but the gist of it was that the 1st and 4th Corps were taken off garrison duty to act as the sledgehammer in its next attack targeting the Pleiades cluster. Also during this time, the SLM fleets roamed up and down the line hunting for Taurians. Unfortunately, this tactic led to more losses than gains. Nine Star League warships were destroyed compared to only five in the Concord Navy. Only the AWFS Auxiliary Corps made an assault during 2579, taking the world of Cohagen after a five-month battle against stubborn militia opposition. One thing Carlos Lee had not been able to provide Wexworth was replacement soldiers for those lost in the fighting. The reason for this was simple. Those men and women were needed elsewhere as the Star League was about to begin Operation Mailed Fist. Major General Nathan Isaacson had been busy training fresh troops within the heart of the Inner Sphere and now found himself being dispatched to a fourth front opening along the border with the Rimwell's Republic. Travelling with them would be the new 8th Provisional Corps, an understrength unit consisting of only two green divisions. Meeting him there would be the 2nd FWLM Auxiliary Corps, led by Duke Narinda Salage, the Prince of Regulus. In acknowledgement of the fact that this new campaign would mean trouble along the longest border the Lyran Commonwealth shared with any of its neighbours, the LCAF was not expected to provide anything more than a small auxiliary corps of its own, helmed by the Archon herself. The first draft of Operation Mailed Fist, known as Case Apollo, called for a short and direct push to the nearby Rimwell's capital to break the siege of Amaris' stronghold. Upon arriving, Isaacson realised just how unrealistic such a venture was. Though just over half of the RWA remained nominally allied, there was no telling how those units would react to SLDF troops moving within their borders. Furthermore, high tensions between the old enemies Steiner and Marek meant that there would be trouble should the Archon take command as the Captain General had done on the Canopian front. Therefore, Commanding General Lee promoted Isaacson to full general and handed command of the Rimwell's front to him. It was understood that no offensive would be undertaken until more forces could be transferred to facilitate a larger campaign than Operation Mail Fist had originally envisioned. 2579 was a quiet year for the war, the only significant action taking place along the Canopian front. A brief week-long campaign in March saw Obrodnovac fall quickly, but if anything this lulled the SLDF into a false sense of ease. When they turned their attention next to Eleusis, their offensive soon stalled as one of the largest battles Task Force Canopus would be engaged in kicked off. The MAF had amassed four battlement regiments on world, including most of the Chasseurs à Cheval, the first time this brigade had fought as a large unit. Supporting them were 18 armour and infantry regiments. Commanding this large task force was a senior MAF colonel, Anne Britt McMillan. All this was unknown to the SLDF, who arrived at the deserted jump points and promptly dispatched their troops towards the planet. But hidden even beyond the distant jump point was a naval carrier and a heavy consignment of aerospace fighters. Once the majority of the ships had started to move in system, the MAF launched an ambush of those transports left behind and was able to seriously damage several of them before withdrawing into distant space. The two-week campaign the ROC had envisioned dragged down into over five months of conflict, with the Magistracy units matching the performance of their Innisfear rivals. However, the newly refurbished Canopian Light Horse regiments were beginning to feel the strain by September, and though they could have continued to hold on perhaps until the end of the year, Colonel Bouquard recognised that their loss would be irreplaceable and ordered a strategic withdrawal from the world on the 19th of that month. Nevertheless, they had taken the wind out of 7th Corps' sails. The only other offensive moves the SLDF made against the Magistracy within the next 12 months were the two short one-month campaigns against Bethanolog in December and Gallus in January. In February 2580, General Wexworth was ready to begin the second wave of Operation Baldrun. Its target was the heavily populated, heavily developed and heavily defended Pleiades Cluster, and the three major worlds within. Defending this nexus was the Taurian Third Corps, which included the bulk of the Pleiades Hussars Brigade. Against them, the SLDF amassed almost the entirety of the First and Fourth Corps. Assaulting such a massive cluster of stars meant naval control would be more important than ever, and to that end Wexworth assigned both the First and Second SLM battle fleets, approximately 30 warships apiece, to lead the attack. 
With almost half of Task Force Taurus's entire naval strength assigned to this one battle, there were few troops movements in 2580 besides this attack. Each fleet appeared at opposite ends of the cluster and began searching for the expected Concord Navy. The Taurians didn't leave them waiting long and engaged the second fleet over the gas giant Archimedes. The Pleiades defence fleet was equivalent in size to one of the Star League flotillas, but they knew the first would be racing to the aid of their allies, so the goal was to do as much damage as possible before departing via nearby pirate points. Over the course of the three day battle, each side accrued losses of more than a dozen warships, dozens more dropships, and hundreds of aerospace fighters. Even after help arrived and the Concordat ships withdrew, the Star League Navy suffered yet more casualties at the hands of so called fire ships. This devious strategy had first been envisioned by Protector Mitchell Calderon and implemented by Marshal David Santos, and involved Torian fanatics hidden among the moons and asteroids of the system, piloting small craft packed with explosives, sometimes even nuclear weapons, and set on suicidal collision courses with the invading vessels. Fourth Corps made simultaneous landfall on all three major worlds on February 23rd, and soon faced a determined TDF counterattack against their landing sites. Losses were extremely heavy, and they were only able to hold on to their foothold through the timely intervention of First Fleet orbital bombardments of enemy positions. Soon after, Wexworth sent in one of his reserve divisions to aid in the taking of the fortified manufacturing complexes. In a spinward direction, Sixth Corps was moving on their own second wave objective, the industrial world of Lothair. Though both sides had committed fewer resources to the campaign over this planet, fighting on Lothair was every bit as bloody and intense as that of the Pleiades cluster. In an effort to keep the SLDF from committing any more forces, the Taurians used pirate points to sneak guerrilla forces onto many of the supposedly conquered worlds including Anaheim, Armington, Cohagen, Somad, Eswan, Tentativa, and Trousen. Rebellions flared up all along the front, and many units that had been planning offensive moves now found themselves either tied down or reinforcing garrisons. By July, the rest of the reserve was committed within the Pleiades cluster, including Nicholas Cameron's company, the worst fighting you would see during the war and by and large the TDF opposition had been crushed. Most of the Taurian Third Corps had been wiped out, and with them, the majority of the experienced Pleiades Hussars. On October 7th, Maya finally capitulated, Merop following suit soon after, and then Electra in early November. Meanwhile, the last of the Taurian Velites regiment on Lothair was eliminated, though it would take several more months for the last of the guerrilla resistance to be subdued. While 2580 was a year of climactic battles, the four notable planets that had been taken, though damaging to the Taurian industry, did little to change the perception that Wexworth was no longer capable of delivering a victory against the Concordat anytime soon. Rather than throw any more reserves at the problem, Carlos Lee decided that he would begin reassigning certain units currently engaged with Task Force Taurus to other fronts beginning early the next year. The situation was a little better on the Canopian front, with the SLDF taking only Esper Birgos in September, Fanadir in April 2581, and Borgen's Rift across September-October later that year. During this time, the MAF were copying their Turian counterparts and launching several raids against supposedly conquered worlds and supply depots within the Inner Sphere, even against the largely neutral Capellan Confederation. 2581 would prove itself to be the most decisive year of the Reunification War. The entire complexion of the conflict would change on the Torian front, and Operations Mailed Fist and Union Hold would finally get underway. All of these events had their origins in a single engagement, the Naval Battle of Robsart. By this point in the war, both the Star League and Concordat navies could still field over a hundred warships apiece within the Torian theatre, and many more smaller support vessels besides. Almost all of these would soon be engaged at Robsart. David Santos, hero of Tentativa, had been recalled to Taurus the previous year to take the post of Marshal of the Navy, one of the three experienced commanders who would advise Senior Marshal Lucinda Grimm on overall strategy. Since taking this position, he had been responsible for the implementation of the new fire ships, though he was personally opposed to what he considered to be a waste of both men and resources. Now though, the most senior naval officer at the front was Marshal Hissel Cardenas, commander of the Taurian Third Fleet, stationed at Robsart. Another fleet was at nearby Flintoft, outfitting the system with a contingent of over a hundred fire ships. An even larger flotilla was currently mustering in the Medali system for a counterattack against the Inner Sphere. Star League operations began when the first fleet moved into the Flintoft system on March 15th, where they stumbled upon the Torian vessels. A vicious nine-hour engagement at the jump point ensued, which saw the SLN lose 16 warships, approximately half of First Fleet. The Taurians were equally bloodied, losing nine warships of their own along with dozens of dropships and over a hundred of the fireships that they had only just brought to Flintoft. As the Concord Navy was withdrawing, a second engagement was just beginning at Robsart, 
Admiral Janissa Franklin was the highest ranking officer representing the SLN on the front and third in command of Operation Baldrun. She arrived at Rob Sutton at Deer Point at the head of one of the Star League fleets and was set upon by a small armada of fireships and 11 dropships. Every one of these was wiped out, but the Torians succeeded in disabling two warships and destroying several smaller craft. Taking a moment to catch her breath, Franklin soon discovered the presence of Marshal Cardenas, whose third fleet was deep within the Robsart system. Battle was not immediately joined between the two fleets, giving them time to assess their situation. Both knew that they already had a significant naval strength in system, and many nearby friendly fleets they could call upon for aid, but crucially, both also lacked this knowledge about the other. Cardenas immediately began sending out messengers to the survivors of Flintoft, the strike fleet at Medali, and anyone else that could be found to join them at Robsart in the hopes of catching and destroying an entire SLM fleet. Likewise, Franklin dispatched ships to request that the unassigned battle fleet sitting in reserve jump to their aid, but because she had only just arrived herself, it took some time before her messengers could charge their drives and depart. This short delay would actually play a decisive role in the coming battle. Cardenas began moving in the direction of the Seventh World, and Franklin responded in kind. Her plan was to engage the Torians in a holding action in orbit around this world long enough for her reinforcements to perform an extremely high risk mass jump into orbit themselves and immediately join the battle. The Marshal was slow in her approach, allowing the Star League Admiral a chance to take up a defensive position in orbit. When the Torian fleet finally arrived, they remained at maximum range for the first hour of combat. Cardenas had delayed on purpose, allowing the Torian reinforcements time to materialize and begin an immediate burn towards Robsart 7 something that Franklin remained unaware of until the Medali strike fleet began appearing over the horizon. Now the tables turned. The SLN maintained a firepower advantage on an individual ship basis, but they were outnumbered 2 to 1. Nevertheless, they made the Torians pay, destroying over the next 6 hours a quarter of the combined Concordat fleet, twice their own casualties. The two sides disengaged, but another short long-range encounter happened soon after. 25 hours after the first shots had been fired, the SLN reinforcements began appearing around the planet. Their close proximity gave Cardenas only a handful of hours before they would be close enough to reinforce Franklin, so the Marshal re-engaged while she still maintained a numbers advantage, and drew the combat into a large dust cloud, within which both fleets broke down into smaller squadrons and fought at close range. The dust cloud made communications extremely challenging and obscured sensors. Another wave of Torian warships and a large consignment of fireships arrived to offset the Star League Navy reinforcements, both groups entering the fray within the large Lagrangian dust cloud. This environment proved the Torians undoing, however, and the Marshal was not able to perform surprise flanking maneuvers as she had hoped. After a mere five hours, half the Torian fleet was in ruins, and Cardenas called for a general retreat, but even this proved a challenge as they were not able to reach all of their ships engaged within the cloud. The Concord Navy performed an intrasystem jump and arrived in orbit around the main world of Robsart. Some ships were too damaged to fight and withdrew entirely, and it was around this point that Marshal David Santos, commander of the Concord Navy, first started to realize just how bad the meat grinder had become. He frantically dispatched orders to what naval assets he could reach not to enter the melee at Robsart, but this was too late to stop yet another Torian fleet from becoming embroiled. The final naval engagement began on March 30th, 2581, one month short of the three-year anniversary of the declaration of war. By now, the last of the Torian reinforcements had made their way to join Cardenas around the planet Robsart and its three moons, but Franklin's fleet had swelled to over a hundred warships, almost the entirety of the SLN contingent of Task Force Taurus. The Torians had all their cards on the table by this point, and had no real tricks up their sleeves apart from another detachment of fireships brought in with the third wave of reinforcements. The superior numbers and firepower of the Star Lake Navy allowed them to inflict significant damage upon their opponents. The three-day battle drew to a close on May 2nd when Cardenas withdrew and finally left the system with what little remained of her fleet two days later. The naval battle of Robsart was over. In total, the Star League had deployed 120 warships against the Concordat's 100. Both sides had also fielded armadas of hundreds of dropships, many hundreds more aerospace fighters, and several hundred fireships on the Torian side. Well over a thousand craft had seen combat. The Concord Navy had suffered irreplaceable casualties, a total of more than 70 warships lost, 80 including those at Flintoft. The Torian shipyards had already been struggling to replace those lost over the prior three years, but this was the killing blow. Their main military strength, that of their navy, had been devastated. Only a few dozen scattered vessels remained, far too few to pose a challenge to the invaders. Through her family's close ties to the ruling Calderons, Cardenas was spared from the consequences of losing such a decisive battle. The blame instead fell on Marshal Santos, who Mitchell Calderon believed to cost them a victory by preventing further reinforcements. He was removed from office soon after, 
In hindsight, we can say with some confidence that even the entire Concorde Navy could not have won the day. Starley casualties numbered at 30 warships, the equivalent of a full battle fleet. A further 50 had been heavily damaged and would spend the next few years out of action. Despite this, it had been a major strategic victory and losses were comparatively few compared to the Torians or the Flintoft engagement. Crucially though, the Star League possessed fleets of hundreds more vessels within the Inner Sphere interior and could quickly replace the losses to bring the four fleets back up to full operational strength within the year, though in truth it was no longer necessary. When word of the victory reached the MOC, the response was immediate. Now that the SLDF had broken the back of the Torians, final victory was viewed as inevitable. Despite Wexworth's objections, three divisions of troops had already been reassigned to Task Force Mailed Fist, and now that operation was given the go-ahead. Despite this, the ground invasion scheduled for that year continued as planned. The first was the invasion of Flintoft on March 27th. First Corps' landfall had freed up the First Fleet to depart the system for Robsart just in time for the final battle against the Concord Navy. A force of 300 Torian conventional fighters kept the regular army boxed in at their landing site for a fortnight before the SLDF was finally able to win control of the skies. The 43rd Light Horse returned to the front and along with them Captain Nicholas Cameron who had spent the last year jumping between Wexworth and First Corps' headquarters group. The 69th Concordat Chasseurs, one of the few surviving elements of the Torian Third Corps, managed to resist until late July before they were all but eliminated. Even still, the ever-present guerrilla forces dragged the campaign on for another 11 months, during which time Nicholas moved up to the position of battalion commander. The invasion of Robsart began on April 30th, when the SLDF 3rd Corps made landfall. They had been patiently waiting at the Nadir jump point for several weeks while Admiral Janissa Franklin waged war on the Concord Navy. Upon their arrival, however, they were horrified to discover that Franklin had occupied her time by ordering the orbital bombardment of every city on the planet. The Admiral had been outraged at the loss of so many of her warships, especially to the suicidal fireships the Torians had employed. Now she viewed every civilian as a potential suicide bomber and took action to eliminate as many as possible. Over 20,000 died before Third Corps took over operations, including the planet's TDF defenders, the 1st and 90th Concordat Chasseurs, the latter having only just been formed a few months earlier. The survivors were anything but submissive, however. Most had lost their homes and families, and were now spurred into a frenzy with no regard for their own safety. Human wave attacks were common, many of the civilians attacking with little more than bits of rubble and debris. It was a situation that couldn't last though. By the end of July, the fight had gone out of them, and the last of the resistance was mopped up the following month. A major humanitarian effort began soon after, but by this point the death toll was in the millions. Robsart radicalised the entire Torian Concordat. While the naval battle might have signalled the beginning of the end, the orbital bombardment spurred the populace onto ever greater acts of defiance and sacrifice. Wexworth had been one of the few holdouts still trying to enforce the Ares Conventions, but now he faced an opponent that would use every measure available to them. The General requested Admiral Franklin reports and explain her actions when he learned of the severity of the situation on Robsart, but Franklin never gave him the opportunity to remove her from command. Forming an ad hoc naval task force of loyal ships and captains, the Admiral effectively went rogue and began an 18-month campaign to track down the surviving Torian warships and wipe them out. She never succeeded in this task, but her efforts were at least responsible for the destruction of several squadrons of fireships around a number of as yet unattacked systems. When she finally returned to the fold, her court-martial absolved her of any wrongdoing, allowing her to continue her career in a high administrative position. With the main body of the fighting coming to an end on Flintoff and Robsart, it was time for the next assaults, beginning with an attack on Brusset on July 2nd and followed up a month later at Werfer. Both worlds were garrisoned by a volunteer guard battlement regiment and a strong heavy armour support force. Furthermore, two battalions of infantry commanders were dispatched to Diefenbaker aboard captured Torian vessels from the Robsart engagement that would allow them to infiltrate key power and communication centres without drawing attention to themselves. 10th Division found the main population centres on Brusset mostly abandoned, thinking the Torians had fled to avoid a repeat of the orbital bombardments they had suffered a few months earlier. However, the truth soon became apparent when the entire division began to show signs of sickness. The Torians had poisoned all the major water supplies on World and now descended on the stricken SLDF forces. A full three quarters of the unit, some 6,000 men and women in total, died as a result of the poisoning or by direct assault, including the commanding lieutenant general. Only orbital strikes from their naval escort were able to hold back the attacking TDF troops. At Werfer, the SLDF fell victim to radiological and chemical weapons that killed both sides indiscriminately. Such weapons were now used freely in the aftermath of Robsart, 
fighting on Brassa and Werfa drew on into late 2582, during which time the volunteer guard forces were utterly destroyed. The main assault on Diefenbaker began on August 9th, using troops culled from the invasion of Flintoff and Robsart. Within a month, all the major industrial sites and population centres were under Star League control. The second Torian Guard had been all but eliminated by November, leaving only a militia general offering any organised resistance. The final battle took place in December, high in the Corrigan Hills, and was an all-infantry affair. After a month of fighting tooth and nail, the SLDF, spearheaded by the 88th Light Horse, finally broke through, only to discover that the last few hundred Torian survivors had committed mass suicide to avoid falling into Starly hands. The Battle of Corrigan Hills would become the stuff of legends on both sides of the war. A single regiment of Torian militia had held off two divisions. The end result was a death toll of over 5,000 on the Star League side. This was totally unacceptable to those back on Terra. By 2582, the war against the Concordat was about to enter its fourth year. Far from being a brief affair, all the Star League had achieved in that time was to take possession of a mere third of the Torian industry. The Concord Navy may have lain in ruins around Robsart, but there was no indication that the periphery nation would surrender anytime soon. With Wexworth at the wheel, it seemed likely that the war might drag on for another decade. By now, the prolonged conflict was beginning to take a serious toll on those frontline units. None were at full operational strength, most were down by 40%. Casualty figures since the start of the conflict for each corps ranged from the equivalent of half their total manpower on the low end, to as high as one and a half times their total for the worst affected. Naturally then, few of those who had started the war were still fighting, many were green recruits. This was even true of several high-ranking officers, and in January 2582, the end came for General Charles Main's team Wexworth. The writing had been on the wall for some time, but what little support he had back on Terra had finally dissipated, and he was removed from command. His time as General of Task Force Taurus can be judged in one of two ways. On the one hand, he tried his best to stick to the Ares Conventions to reduce civilian casualties, and he trusted in his staff of officers to carry out his orders. His biggest mistake was viewing the entire war, and by extension his command, as a means to a political end, one he ultimately failed to achieve. Most of all though, he was a victim of wildly inaccurate estimations on how much resistance the Torians would put up. He was neither prepared for the intensity of the conflict, nor were those on Earth prepared to reassess their expectations. Someone new was needed.